We're continuing on in our series called Out of the Shallows. How do you go into a deeper life in Christ? And we're seeing how the Holy Spirit actually helps us accomplish this. And uh, what I've discovered is, is that uh, there's a lot of self-help books available. In fact, I did a quick check and on Amazon alone, there's over 85,000 self-help books available, which confused me because I would have thought that if one of them worked, that's all that would be needed. <laughs> and so it turns out there's a lot of things we want to improve. We want to improve our destiny. We want to have better habits. We want to control our thoughts. We want to be more effective. We want to have more happiness in our life. We want to care less about some things and experience more discipline in other things and have more influence and experience more confidence, worry less, have more courage, like all these things. And wouldn't it be great if just by reading a book that would happen? Um, I'm wondering though that if we became an improved version of ourselves. Does that actually make us a better person? Maybe you can get more effective, more efficient, but, that, but does that make you anything other than more affluent or more comfortable? And you have to know that the purpose of the gospel is not just to get more stuff or to be more comfortable. God is working something a lot deeper than all of that. What would you like to improve in your life? Would you like to be more confident? Would you like to look better? Would you like to have more money? And the question is, if you had that, would you actually be a better person? Um, I think there's a better goal. And the better goal is not just becoming a better person, but becoming more like Jesus. I actually think that's a better goal. And I actually think that the process for becoming more like Jesus is different than gaining confidence in how we talk or how we look. So I'd like us to look at a short passage of scripture written by the Apostle Paul, and you can find it in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. By the way, we always put verses up on the screen for your convenience, but I also really encourage if you have a Bible with you or a smart device that has a Bible on it, it's always good to use that because you can highlight it, you can mark it, you can refer back to it later. In 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, beginning in verse 17, it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. I think it's healthy and helpful to want to improve some things in our life, but I don't think that's the same thing as transformation. Here's what I want you to see this morning. The Holy Spirit did not come to give you a better image. He gave, came to give you a new identity. And that's way deeper than anything our world thinks about or calls for. Uh, it is possible to be more of all the things we desire and still be nothing like Jesus. In fact, if we actually improve our lives, sometimes we can become more judgmental of other people who haven't done that improvement in their own lives. We can start looking down on them. We were able to do it. They could do it if they tried to. So the question starts becoming, so how does the Holy Spirit actually bring transformation into our lives? Like, is it an experience that you have? Like, is that what does it? Is it impersonating Jesus, you know, try to figure out how he did certain things and then mimic that as best we possibly can. And to be sure, the Gospels are filled full of information that show us the things that he did and, and, and give us the, the words that he spoke, and they do tell us a lot about Jesus and including that he laid down his life for us. And when you actually begin to look at Jesus, you see something more than just words spoken or deeds done. You see something about him. For example, Jesus was free to be the same person in 
public that he was in private. Do you know how rare that is? We kind of are, are chameleons with our personalities sometimes, trying to fit into whatever environment we walk into. But Jesus had a capacity of, of being the same person, and he wasn't trying to imitate anybody else. He was also free to love others. He was free to love others. He actually saw value in anyone. And especially for people who weren't used to having value seen in them, when you express that value, that means a lot to them. But that can be very off-putting to other people around in the culture who looks at them and says, why are you doing that? Um, by the way, we don't have to spend a lifetime learning this. We figure this out when we're in elementary school. What lunch table do you sit at? We're already deciding value. Um, with Jesus, no one was unimportant. And if you spent time with Jesus, you believed that you were important to God. He was also incredibly confident in his relationship with his heavenly father. He actually said, I limit the things that I say to things that I hear from him, and I limit the things that I do to things that I see him do. That's a remarkable thing. And on top of that, he didn't interpret or reinterpret his relationship with his father based on the circumstances he was going through. He actually had people walk away from him. He had people who rejected him. He had people who attempted to kill him and eventually succeeded in doing so. Yet in none of those occasions did he ever assume that God had left him because other people were mistreating him. He had this kind of confidence it's a really remarkable thing. So what does this mean for us? I think the Holy Spirit can work transformation in us. So the Holy Spirit will help us pretend less. Pretend less. How do you do that? Well, oddly enough, all it requires is for you to focus more on others than self. We're more likely to pretend when we're focused on us and making sure we fit into whatever room we walk into. Our goal changes from wondering what people will think about us to wondering how we can serve them. That makes a huge difference. And when that happens, we actually become a more authentic person. There's a great quote. I wish I could remember the name of the person who came up with it right now. But this is the quote, the only currency left in this bankrupt culture of ours is what we share with each other when we're not trying to impress each other. Isn't that amazing? So much of our interactions are about trying to improve our value in someone else's eyes instead of serving someone else because they have a need. The Holy Spirit helps us respond to others. We actually respond better to people who are within our reach. We, we become more aware of what's going on in their lives and how there's something that we could do that we could respond in, and it would actually be helpful or beneficial to them. We find ourselves being more generous with our time, more generous with our resources, more generous with our relationships. We protect our time, our resources, and our relationships a lot because we don't want to get trapped in a group of people that would somehow devalue us in someone else's eyes. I also believe that we become more hopeful. And it's not because everything is wonderful. It's because in everything we're going through, we know God is going through it with us. We actually learn to see evidence of God's care apart from a resolved issue. So maybe the issue's not resolved, but you find that God is giving you the strength you need to get through the day, and that's evidence of his love. Maybe someone brings a word of encouragement, that's evidence of his love. There's all these resources that he keeps funneling into our lives while we're going through hard times. Another thing that happens is we begin to want what God wants. 
rather than just wanting what we want. What does God want for you personally? That'd be a really worthwhile focus point. Uh, what does God want for your family? What does God want for our community? What does God want for our culture? A lot of times these questions never come up. People say, well, I have a vision for something. Yet yeah, by vision, they just mean usually a personal preference they want to impose on somebody else. A picture of life as the way they would prefer it to be. What are God's hopes and dreams for people? That's worth finding out. So uh, if you're like me and you're on a spiritual journey and you actually want to be transformed, you probably have had some moments when you felt like you gained some ground. Let's just check. Anybody ever had a single moment in your entire spiritual life where you felt like you took a step forward? Yeah. And then how, same, same group of people, let's see. Uh, and how many have felt like at least once you took a step backward? How many felt like you took more than one step backwards? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just true, isn't it? And we get so disappointed with ourselves because we thought that we had escaped the capacity to be afraid or to be self-focused or to be so materialistic. And then we find ourselves going back to those defaults and, and it, it's frustrating. Um, sometimes we'll go back to pretending to be something that we are rather than being our authentic selves. We find ourselves disconnecting, being less connected with others. And another thing I think that happens is less hopeful when things don't go the way that we want. One door gets closed and now we think our entire future is gone. And it's not. We just can't imagine a different one. And I think that Sometimes we take a step backward and we wind up becoming more demanding of God and others. I actually knew a person who they were tired of a single lifestyle until they, they gave God a, 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 a deadline date. If I'm not married by this date, I'm not going to your church anymore. And, and we miss them because <laughs> that didn't happen. So how does the Holy Spirit bring transformation to our lives? And this is worth focusing on. And the first thing I want you to see is that trans transformation actually uses a lifetime. All of your life can be part of the transformation. We desire transformation. We want to be better. We want to be different. We want to be more like Jesus. But we get frustrated because that doesn't happen in an instant. Wouldn't it be great? If, if someone could just lay their hand on you when you were instantly transformed to be more like Jesus, wouldn't it be great if, if while we were in worship today and our hands were up, you would just have this incredible experience where you were instantly and effortlessly transformed to be like Jesus. Wouldn't that be great? And the truth is, is that it, there's always more work to do. Would you please hear that? There's always more work to do. There's a lot of distance between us and Jesus. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. Brothers and sisters, the Apostle Paul writes, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. No transformation, no growth. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human Beings. The apostle gives evidence of needed transformation. He says, if you see this in your life, you got a lot of growth to experience. When you're immature, not fully developed. When you have a limited spiritual diet. Well, I don't want to hear about some of that stuff. Why? Hmm. Jealousy, which shows up in two ways. When you feel envious because somebody has something you wanted or you feel suspicious of someone you're in a relationship with because you think they want someone else. He says that's evidence transformation's not happening. Quarreling. 
Quarreling are heated arguments and disagreements about something trivial. How many are glad we've been exempt from that for the last two years? Like that went completely away. And then preferred styles. Well, I'm, I'm really fed by the kind of, of teaching that, that Paul gives. Another person says, well, I really like the way Apollo says it. And he said, what Paul says is, you're missing the point. The person doing the teaching is giving you the word of God, which can transform your life. But if you limit it to, yeah, I don't listen to preachers or teachers who look like, sound like, or act like that. Hmm. That's quite a limitation. Transformation also is not just taking a lifetime. It also is remedial. Uh, there are seasons when we feel like we've grown, and then there are seasons when we feel like we've taken a step backwards. There are times when we felt more optimistic, and then we go into a season where we feel less optimistic, maybe even pessimistic, and, and we're surprised when we get it right. Has that ever happened to you? You know, God puts you in a situation, and you got it right. You said the right thing in the right way to the right person, and God did something to help them, and you go back and go, oh, yes, I finally learned something. And then like before the day is over, you get it wrong again. It's just, what happened to me? And uh, our tendency is to focus on the outward part of us. And God always focuses on the inside of us. It's an internal process that he works. There's a song that was written uh, a few years ago. I really love the, the lyrics of it. It says, I stand, I fall, you take my hand, and you give me grace to stand again. You teach, you test, we try again until I understand. I try and I fail miserably. You pick me up so patiently. You walk me back where we began, and we begin again. Your lessons are remedial. Your patience, unbelievable. Stumbling into holiness is the only way we learn, I guess. Doesn't it feel like that? And God's incredibly patient with us. There's another thing that's important for transformation. It's going to use your whole life. It's, there's going to be remedial parts of it, but it also requires your personal participation. By this, I do not mean that you are earning something or you are causing something. The Holy Spirit wants to work in us and he wants to work on us, but he doesn't do it apart from us. We participate. I wish transformation could just happen automatically. I wish there was some power encounter I could have with God that would instantly and effortlessly make me like Jesus. I, I wish there was an experience that I could have. And this is what I will tell you. There are lots of people who look for those kinds of experiences. And by the way, you will find them, but they won't do what you want to. You'll feel close to God. You'll feel connected with God. You'll feel impressed by what God can do, but that doesn't mean that internal changes have occurred. We have to partner with God. So how does this happen now? It's the worship team to come out. Transformation requires learning to listen. And listening is not a natural skill that we have, especially listening to God. We talked last week about the request that we should make to God, and that's appropriate, and we're invited to do so. But here's the risk. It's possible to pray prayers that change the world around you without experiencing any change within you. It happens a lot. So what do we have to learn to do? You have to learn to be quiet before God. Now, for some of us, being quiet is a little easier than for others of us. 
If you wonder if you're good at it or not good at it, this is a little thing that I recommend. Just go sit in a place, be quiet, put a timer on your phone or some device that you have for two minutes and just try to be quiet and do nothing and say nothing for two minutes. For me, it always feels longer than two minutes. Sometimes we go into our devotional time and our focus is checking a box for God. See, I'm reading your word. Check. See, I'm remembering to pray for people. Check. See, I, I logged my time today. Check. And, and being quiet with God is about being with God, not doing for God. And there are some of us, we've attended a lot of church services and we have read a lot of scriptures and we have prayed a lot of prayers, but our focus has been on what we are doing for God instead of just being with him. We cannot cooperate with the Holy Spirit if we don't listen to what he has to say. And listening is not the privilege for the spiritual professional or the spiritual elite. Jesus said all his sheep know his voice. So here's what I'd recommend. Uh, just before you go into scripture, you're going to read a passage. Just quiet your heart and be with God. You've done this in other ways sometimes, right? Maybe you have a close friend, a life partner, a sibling, a parent, and you go out for a walk and you sit on a bench and the words aren't what's important right then. They're there. And you just look at the world around you and you're with them. You can do that with God. Here's the challenge is when you try to do it, you're going to have other thoughts come jumping into your brain. And so this is what I encourage you to do. When you catch yourself thinking thoughts about other things, don't beat yourself up about it. Just hand it off to God and say, well, <laughs> I was thinking about this. You probably noticed. Here, I'll give it to you. And then... Here's what I will tell you. Out of that silence and out of his word, you'll notice a different kind of thought coming to you. And it's, it's not a thought about how you feel about yourself or something else. It's not even a thought about just a truth that was in scripture. It's often a thought about a step, an action, something you can do. And it's amazing how many of us just assume that that thought is created by ourselves. But I'm going to encourage you that after you've quieted yourself with God and spend a little time in his word, and you're asking him to help you with your day and with your life, when those thoughts come, capture them. We talked about this the first week of, of having a way where you just kind of notice how the Holy Spirit is helping. Put it in a journal or put it in a notebook. Put it in a, in a note app that you have on your smart device. And this is what you'll discover. A thought might come to you, it's time to forgive that person. Hmm. Maybe the thought will come to you, you need to text or call or email a word of encouragement to someone and you'll, you'll know who it is. Maybe the thought will be you've run from this situation long enough. It's time to face it. Don't ignore that. Listening to what the Holy Spirit is calling you to and responding to that is how transformation occurs. Maybe the Holy Spirit would tell you it's time to apologize to someone. You've avoided them long enough. Maybe the Holy Spirit, he's, he's done this to me, and by the way, I don't like it. 
But he'll say, in this conversation, you need to listen and not talk. When you go to talk to someone else, you've already got your whole list of things you want to talk to. Just listen. Attending to these promptings of the Holy Spirit is what allows the transformation to occur in our life. You can recite verses and doctrinal points and never experience transformation. But if we listen and we obey, it makes all the difference in the world. Would you bow your heads this morning? So, Father, um, we don't just want to learn about what you used to do or look forward to what you're going to do. We want you to be involved in our lives right now. And we don't pretend to be the image of Jesus, but we want to become more like him. So we ask your Holy Spirit to be at work in our hearts and in our lives. And as best as we can discern your voice to us, we will try to respond to that. And I ask that you will use those moments to transform our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.